You know, I, Pam and I, many of you all are aware, but we had the privilege of serving as missionaries with the International Mission Board for about 10 years. And I can just say it's a great organization. I'm so proud of how God uses them around the world and very blessed as a church that we get to partner with such a great, uh, great team and great group of people. Well, we've been in a sermon series that we're going to be wrapping up next Sunday called Moved with Compassion. It goes with our season of compassion that started, as I mentioned, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And in this sermon series, we've been looking at those times in Scripture that talk about how Jesus was himself moved with compassion. So what happens in the life of the most compassionate person in history that would bring them to an even greater level of compassion. Well, that's what we've been looking at. And today we're going to continue that. We're going to be in Mark chapter 1. Go ahead and open your Bibles there. Uh, we've got some introductory material to cover before we get there. But go ahead and open to Mark chapter 1. Maybe bookmark that. We'll come back to it in just a moment. If you don't have a Bible with you, not to worry. In the robe in front of you, beneath the seat, you'll find a Bible there. Pull that out and use it for the day. Take it home. Give it to a friend. We just want to make sure it's in good use. That's all we can ask. Let's go ahead and let's pray, and then we're going to jump in and get started in Mark chapter 1. Lord, we love you. We're grateful for all that you do and are doing in our life, and we thank you for Jesus and for what he has done for us to change and transform and to make new. And Lord, we are also grateful for the gift of your word. We believe that it is true and that we should build our life on it. And so, Father, today, as we look into it, we just ask that you illuminate our heart, teach us, and help us to be different people when we leave here today. We pray this in Jesus' great name. Amen. Well, a few weeks ago, CNN on their website put an article out that was spinning up toward Halloween. And uh, the article, The Age of the Vampire, has given way to the age of the zombie. Okay, And it was talking about how years ago... Uh, it was always the vampire. They were always the main mutant, you know, de jour in any kind of scary movie or on TV. And how over time that's changed from vampires to zombies. In fact, now zombies so thoroughly rule the spookiverse. I just made that word up right now, okay? <laughs> but they so rule that there are eight television shows about zombies currently out there right now. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about zombies, I don't want your zombie education to be lacking, okay? So let me just lay out the very basics for you. Basically, a zombie is someone who is dead but is not dead because what happened is they were infected with a virus that causes them to reanimate. It just doesn't do a very good job. So they're not in very good shape. Now, the truth is, in zombie land, everybody is actually carrying the virus, all right? So everybody, when they die, they're going to get reanimated as a zombie. So I guess you could say there's a little bit of zombie in every single one of us, all right? And when you die, you get reanimated. Now, the, the bottom line is zombies, they're always disheveled. They're always dressed in rags. They're incredibly unhygienic. Um, they're basically disgusting. You don't want to come into touch, into contact with a zombie. Uh, they're really pretty gross, infectious, and unlovable. But there's good news. The article in CNN does go on to mention that the reason that zombies have become so popular today is that anybody can become a zombie. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter your religion. It doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't, none of that matters. Zombies are very egalitarian. They're very equal opportunity. You too can become a zombie. And not only could you become a zombie, but no matter who you are, male, female, no matter the race, you can go hunting for zombies. So zombies are the perfect villain, the perfect mutant for our day and age because anybody and everybody can become one or haunt one. So that's, that's really good news. And you might be thinking right now, David, it is Christmas. Why are we looking at a story from Halloween? Well, just you know, to bring this to you know, this month, I did find this book on Amazon. It's beginning to look a lot like zombies, a book of Christmas carols for zombies. And so you can go there. It really is a thing. And I am not recommending this book, you all. I'm just telling you what I found. The book jacket says that the songs are guaranteed to lift the spirits of the lumbering, shuffling undead and their temporary, temporarily still breathing meals to be. That's you and me, okay? So even zombies want you to have a very merry Christmas, all right? Now really, 
why aren't we talking about this now? Well, back in the day when Jesus was here on this earth, they had their own version of the living dead. And it wasn't fictional, and it wasn't for entertainment, it wasn't a game, but it was equal opportunity. Anybody could become a part of the living dead. It didn't matter if you were rich, didn't matter if you were poor, male, female, foreigner, local, didn't make any difference. Everybody could become one. You could become a part of the living dead. In the living dead, in Jesus' day, the living dead were people who had been diagnosed with a disease called leprosy. Now, leprosy was a very broad term. It included about 75 different illnesses of the skin. Diagnostics weren't all that precise back in Jesus' day. And so if you presented the symptoms that might indicate leprosy, you were declared to be a leper. You were treated as such. And the law in the Old Testament was very strict about dealing with leprosy because in Jesus' day, leprosy was uncurable. And it's a very, very debilitating disease. If you uh, contract leprosy, and if it's left unchecked and untreated, it attacks the body in such a way that the body literally begins to fall apart. Fingers, toes, nose, ears, hands, feet, literally all disintegrate and give way to the reality of infection. And there is no cure, there was no cure back in the day of Jesus. So you can understand why they took leprosy pretty seriously, right? It would make sense, right? Leviticus chapters 13 and 14 talk to us about the rules regarding how leprosy was to be treated. But in verse 45 of chapter 13, it sums it up this way. The person afflicted with an infectious skin disease is to have his clothes torn and his hair hanging loose. So it affected the way you dressed, right? Your clothes were torn. It affected your hairstyle. Your hair was hanging loose. And he must cover his mouth and cry out, unclean, unclean. He will remain unclean as long as he has the infection. He is unclean. He must live alone in a place outside the camp. So lepers typically lived in colonies outside of the city. And being sent to one of these places was typically a life sentence. You were there until your skin cleared up. And maybe that never happens. And so you were there until you potentially until you died. And the law said that anybody who came in contact with a leper was to be declared unclean themselves. So to avoid this, whenever someone saw someone whose clothes were rags and whose hair was all unkept, they'd start throwing rocks at them to make sure there was no way they would ever come in contact with someone who was a leper. By the time we come to Jesus' day, the rules had gotten even stricter. The religious laws had clamped down even further, making the life of someone who had leprosy even more difficult because it wasn't bad enough already. If a leper came by your home and just stuck their head in the door to say hello, the entire house was deemed to be unclean. And because of this, it was against the law to even greet a leper. You couldn't even say hello to one. By law, a leper had to stay 150 feet away from someone if they were upwind and six feet away if they were downwind. This was a really serious, serious problem. Now, the religious leaders of Jesus' day had their own word, their own term to describe a leper. The term they used was the living dead. If you're a leper... You were among the living dead. You were someone that everyone was afraid to touch. You were someone that everyone was afraid to be near. You were the living dead. You were a zombie. Now, the Bible teaches us that poor people had leprosy, kings had leprosy, men, women, everybody, didn't matter who you were, totally equal opportunity disease. But there's more to this disease than even meets the eye. We think today about illness and disease as something that's contracted from a virus or, or from bacteria, from some sort of infection, those kinds of things. That's how we contract a disease. And so in order to stay healthy, what do we do? We do things like eating right, exercising regularly, washing our hands frequently. We make sure, you know, we, uh, we, you know, we know how to cough whenever we've got a cold. You know, you do the, oh, you know, you dap when you cough. We got all that. We know, right? 
that you do these things to prevent your disease from spreading. We go to the doctor once a year, annual checkup. We try to stay on top of this thing. We understand there is a connection between infection, viral, bacterial, whatever it might be, and our health, our welfare, right? We get that. We put all that together. But in Jesus' day, now they understood this in Jesus' day as well, and they valued the healing arts. They valued science. They, they weren't anti-science. They knew that medicine could help you be better and all of that. They were all for science. But in Jesus' day, they also understood that not only was it something physical, like a bacteria or like a virus that could make you sick. In Jesus' day, they understood that you could become sick because of a spiritual problem as well. Now, this seems very foreign to us, even though we understand that emotional distress, for example, can cause illness. Like we understand the connection between stress and heart disease, for example, or the stress and a lot of problems with our digestive system. We get that. But the idea that you might become sick because of a spiritual problem, totally foreign to us. But in Jesus' day, it was common knowledge. Look at John chapter 9. Jesus is with his disciples, and they see a man who was born blind. Look at the question the disciples asked Jesus. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Do you see that question? Whose fault is it? Who sinned here? Because this man was born blind. Is it possible that you know, God, looking at the man's future, knows he's going to be a sinner, so let's just strike him blind now before he's ever born? Or was it because of his parents? Why was this guy born blind? It was a spiritual problem. It was a spiritual cause. This was especially true of leprosy. If you go to the Old Testament and you come to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 15, verse 5 and following, it tells you the story about a man named Uzziah. Uzziah was the king of the country of Judah. And overall, Uzziah was not a bad king, but he did do something pretty seriously wrong. Uzziah tolerated pagan worship in the nation of Judah. This offended God greatly, and God struck Uzziah with what disease? What do you think? With leprosy. Here is Uzziah, the king of the country, now a leper, forced to live outside of the community. His son Jotham takes over the day-to-day running of the kingdom, and he lives out the rest of his days as a leper, stricken by God. Now, Over time, the people of Israel began to see leprosy as judgment from God. If you were a leper, God was punishing you for sin. If you were a leper, you had it coming. You deserved it. So how much sympathy do you think people had for lepers, for all of those people living outside of the community? You think they cared about them? None at all because those were people who were getting their comeuppance from God himself. Now one more thing about leprosy before we move into the story. Because leprosy was often seen as judgment from God and being sourced by God himself, there was only one person who could heal leprosy. Who do you think could heal it? If God inflicted you with it, who then could take it from you? God. Only God could heal you from leprosy. So this is a big deal. Healing somebody from leprosy just right up there with bringing somebody back from the dead. It was that big a deal. So when a leper approaches Jesus, who is now a new rabbi, beginning his teaching ministry in Israel, nobody would have been surprised if Jesus had looked at this man and rejected him because the conventional wisdom was that this man had leprosy because he was guilty. He had leprosy because God was judging him. He had leprosy and he had it coming. He was not supposed to be anywhere near Jesus. And any good self-respecting respecting rabbi would want to make sure that he kept himself ceremonially clean, ceremonially pure. He should have had nothing to do with a leper. But in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 40, all of this is turned on its head. Look at what happens. Then a man with a serious skin disease, read that leprosy, came to him and on his knees begged him, if you're willing, you can make me clean. 
Now, the fact that the leper came close to Jesus is scandalous. It's a really big deal. This is how bold this leper was. Remember, they were supposed to stay 150 feet away from someone if they were upwind, no closer than six feet if they were downwind. This gentleman comes within touching distance of Jesus Christ and falls on his knees near Jesus. Doesn't he know the rules? Other lepers did. Luke chapter 17 tells a story about 10 lepers who came to Jesus for healing. And the Bible in Luke chapter 17 says that they stood a long distance off and shouted at Jesus asking him for help. Those guys, at least they knew their place. This guy apparently doesn't. He draws near to Jesus. He falls to his knees and he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Notice he's not saying, hey, if you have the power, maybe then you could heal me. That's not what he says at all, is it? He says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. In other words, he's saying, hey, if you want to, you can change my life. If you will show me compassion when nobody else is showing me compassion. If you'd be good to me when nobody else is being good to me because everyone else believes that I'm receiving what I earned. I'm receiving divine judgment for my sin. If you'll be good to me when nobody else has been good to me, you can heal me of this disease. That's hard to do, isn't it? It's tough to let go of somebody else's past. I have the privilege in what I do for a living of working with a lot of couples. And sometimes a couple will come in and And we'll begin to visit. And as they begin to kind of unpackage what's been going on in their marriage, it comes to light that either the husband or the wife has in some way betrayed the other. You know, for whatever reason, whatever kind of betrayal it might have been. But the the trust between the two of them has been breached. And so you're looking at the offended spouse, the one who's been victimized. And you say to them, the pathway for you to get out of this is for you to forgive this other person. The pathway for you to get out of this is to look at their past, their history, and be willing to say, it's done. That's the pathway out of this. You know how hard that is to do? Years ago, when I was a high school student, lived in a little small town called Waverly, Tennessee, and it is tiny, okay? Quincy could beat Waverly in a war. I mean, it's that small a town. And uh, a great place to grow up and, and all of that. And uh, I was very involved in my, in my church, First Baptist Church of Waverly, Tennessee. I was in church every single Sunday, every single Wednesday night. Basically, if the doors were open, we were there. I was a church junkie then. I'm a church junkie now. Some things just never change, right? And so I'm in this church, and uh, something happened that doesn't often happen in a small-town church. Somebody new came to church. And it wasn't just anybody. She was cute, okay? This girl shows up in church, and I see her, and I'm like, wow, she's really cute, you know? And uh, she was brand new as a Christian, and she wound up getting baptized a couple of weeks after she came to church, and, and I'm thinking, she's really cute. She's a believer. This is everything that a church-going boy dreams of. She checks every box, right? And so I finally built up the courage to go to this young girl, and I said, you know, would you like to go out on a date with me? And lo and behold, she said yes. And I'm thinking, this is a really good day. And so you all, I made arrangements to take this girl to the nicest restaurant in Waverly, Tennessee. That's right, Sonic Drive-In. We went to Sonic Drive-In, okay? Not only was it like the nicest restaurant in Waverly, Tennessee, it was just about the only restaurant in Waverly, Tennessee, okay? Now, I don't know if y'all have ever been to a Sonic Drive-In in a small town on a Saturday night, which is the only appropriate night to take your girl on a date, all right? But everybody in town, I mean, at least everybody that's anybody, is at the Sonic Drive-In, right? And so here I am in my car with this cute girl at Sonic Drive-In. And I'm feeling particularly proud about myself at this moment, right? So everybody is seeing me. The whole town is seeing me with this girl. And I'm like, yes, that's right. She's with me, okay? That's where I was at, right? Y'all know the story. The next day, Sunday, and for some reason this girl was not at church that day. I don't know why. And I get to church. 
And I mean from the moment I get out of my car in the parking lot, people are just coming up to me going, what are you doing? What are you thinking? I mean, every person that sees me, that's what I'm getting hit with. I'm like, what? I said, we saw you at Sonic last night. We saw who you were with. Don't you know who that is? Don't you know her story? Don't you know her past? Don't you know the things that that girl has done? What are you doing with that girl? I said, yeah, but she's here. She's in church. She just got baptized. I mean, isn't that who she is now? One guy said to me, he said, listen, I am hoping that she never comes back to this church ever again because we don't need her kind here. Wow. And I was thinking, isn't church supposed to be made up of people of that kind, right? Redeemed by the grace and power of Jesus Christ. I was blown away. She was blown away. She never came back. That was the end of it for her. It's really hard to let go of someone's past. It's really easy to keep them down because of who they were, isn't it? This man comes to Jesus and he says, hey, I've got leprosy, <laughs> right? That means I'm under God's judgment. That means that everybody thinks I'm guilty and I'm getting what I deserve. But if you're willing, you can change everything right now. I mean, are, are you willing to give me a break? Are you willing to look beyond my past? Jesus looks at him in verse 41. He says, it says, moved with compassion. That's a beautiful phrase. Moved with compassion. Jesus reached out his hand and what? Touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately the disease left him and he was healed. Can you imagine how beautiful the compassion of Jesus Christ was to this man in this moment? I mean, there was nothing sweeter than the compassion of Jesus Christ. Now, there's an interesting thing about the word that's translated into our word compassion here in this text. There's an interesting thing about it because the word actually means angry. Jesus was angry and he touched the man. And when I saw that, I thought, what in the world was Jesus angry about? Was he looking at this guy? Was he thinking, hey, for all those things that you've done, all those terrible things that you've been involved in, for the reason that you've been judged and found guilty, the reason that you have leprosy, I look at all that, and when I see that, it angers me. Is that what made Jesus angry? I, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. You know, I mentioned to you before that my wife and I, my family, we worked for the International Mission Board. We lived in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, for a number of years and where we lived in Addis, meaning the specific home, was right on the perimeter of the largest leper colony in Africa, okay? And uh, we saw lepers every single day. It was just a part of our life. It was a part of our existence, and you would see them and their deformity as they made their way up and down the streets. Now, the leper colony was surrounded on two sides by the city dump for a city of about three to four million people. If you look in the foreground of this photograph, you see the city dump. Okay, that's it. In the background, you see the city of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, home, like I said, to about three to four million people. And the leper colony was right on the edge of the dump. In fact, over the years, as the dump had expanded, the dump had kind of grown into the leper colony. And that was, in some ways, advantageous because the lepers, because of their deformity, difficulty moving around, difficulty walking, they foraged in the garbage dump, and that's how they survived. That's how they found what they ate. That's how they found what little bit they might find that would be of value to someone that they could sell. That's how they made their living. So the dump and the leper colony sort of had a relationship with one another. And as the dump continued to expand and, the, and it kind of grew into the leper colony, in March of this year, there was an avalanche in the dump. And it came all over some of the homes of these people. 100 people were killed in this avalanche at the dump in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Terrible tragedy. When I lived there, I had the opportunity to sit down and do about a 45-minute interview with a leper 
And I was talking to this woman about her life and what she experienced. And I asked her this question. I said, will your future be better than your present or your past? And she looked at me and she said, I have no future. I am praying to die. It blew me away. I'll never forget the desperation in her voice. You understand why Jesus was angry? He saw this man. He saw him in his condition. He saw his leprosy. He saw what it had done to him. He saw how it cost him every relationship. He saw how it had destroyed him physically. He saw how he was among the living dead. And when Jesus saw all of that in that moment, he was angry. And he was moved with compassion. And he reaches out and he touches this man. Now that's really curious, by the way, that he would touch him. Because you remember the rules? If you touched a leper, you became what? Unclean. So Jesus reaches out and he touches this guy and he says to the man, I am willing, be made clean. And he makes him clean with his touch. But what happens when Jesus touches this man? He became unclean. Get this straight. Jesus sees this man, sees his condition, knows that if he touches him, he will be unclean. Touches him, the man is clean. Jesus takes on to himself this man's sin, this man's reproach, this man's shame, this man's guilt, this man's infirmity. And Jesus bears that on to himself. There was a prophet in the Old Testament named Isaiah several hundred years before Jesus was born. He saw all of this coming. Look at what he said about Jesus in chapter 53. He said, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Jesus takes on our shame, our guilt, our reproach onto himself. With one touch he transforms us and he makes us new. Now remember, everybody who had leprosy had received it as a curse from God. It was punishment from sin. It came from God, and therefore the conventional wisdom was that only God could remove it. When Jesus touches this man, he's making a declaration. He's saying, I am Emmanuel, God with us. And through Jesus Christ, God is pouring his compassion out on us. It's the compassion of Jesus that makes Christmas unlike any other time of the year. You can't think about the coming of Jesus without being reminded that Jesus offers to make you and me whole with just one touch. And I want you to think about this very carefully. It's possible that you have made a real mess out of your life because of the decisions that you've made. And it may well be that those decisions have cost you in relationships. It may be that you're estranged from this person and that person and that person. It may be that your decisions have cost you your job. It may be that just being in church today is really awkward for you because you've done that and that and that and that. It may be that as you look at yourself, you agree with that leper. You feel like walking down the street and just shouting, unclean unclean get away but I want you to know that the same touch that Jesus Christ extended to that man in Mark chapter 1 he extends it to you and to me and he is willing to touch you and he is willing to set you free from every bit of that and it may be that nobody on this planet seems willing to forget your past but I want you to understand that Jesus Christ will wash it away and make you clean. And he takes our sin and he throws them as far as the east is from the west and he remembers them no more. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? 
That's compassion. And that's the offer that Jesus makes to you. And the only thing that you can do, there's no way to earn it, there's no way to deserve it. The only thing that you can do is to draw near and say, hey, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Let's just pray together right now. Just bow your heads. Father, we just thank you very much for the truth of your word. And we appreciate the fact that you offer to cleanse us from our sin and from our unrighteousness. And we know that that's a limitless gift that's available to anyone who would call upon the name of the Lord. For anyone who just says, Lord, if you would make me clean, that offer is available and we thank you for that. Now for some of you in this room right now, let me just talk to you for a moment. Keep your heads bowed. The opportunity to be made new, to have a fresh start, it's a wonderful possibility. I want you to understand that's exactly what Jesus offers to you now. So why not right now? Why not simply call on the name of Jesus? Why not ask him to make you clean, to make you whole, to make you brand new? Let me pray with you one more time. Father, we ask that you hear our prayer. I know that in this room there are some who are estranged, cut off, unclean. You see us, and you know how our sin has wrecked us, and it makes you angry. And you've determined that you would stop at nothing, not even sparing your own life, to pour yourself out to make us new. And you draw near to us, and you're declaring to us right now, I am willing to make you clean. And so, Father, I pray that for those in this room who desperately need that touch from you, they will call out to you right now, that you will hear their prayer, that you will touch them, and this will be the beginning of a whole new future. We love you, Father, and we pray all this in the great name of Jesus. And everyone agreed and said, Amen. You all that stand.